All right, y'all, welcome to the show. We are playing quite a bit of catch-up today, so we'll dive into it in just a second. Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to have for you, the U.S. unleashes a colossal bombing campaign in the Middle East. We'll talk about that. We have the IDF got caught running a notorious snuff film channel on Telegram. We've actually talked about this thing not too long ago, but now it's proven that the IDF is indeed running it. And I'm talking about the most gruesome videos you could possibly imagine of Palestinians getting massacred. They're proud of this. They're proud of what they're currently doing in Gaza. Then we'll get to uh, the House looks to approve more money for Israel in the midst of their genocide campaign in Gaza. Uh, Biden, get this. Oh, this is so damning. Biden is asking John Fetterman advice for how to get young people to vote for him. I mean, what am I even supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to do with that? How disconnected from reality can you possibly be at this late date to rely on him, the guy who lost virtually all of his youth support? Now it's just Republicans who are cheerleading this guy. Uh, then we'll get to U.S. media has gone absolutely insane. We got, uh, you know, a slate of articles that came out over the past three or four days that are just... Uh, I've, it's, we're right back to post 9-11 total hysteria, fear-mongering, national panic, garbage, bigotry. I mean, every negative word you could think of. Uh, then we'll get to South Carolina primary results. The Dearborn, Michi uh, the Dearborn Michigan mayor goes on CNN and just dismantles them to their face. And then later on, uh, Charles Barkley decides to uh, <laughs> declare holy war on the anti-Taylor Swift Republicans who declared holy war on her. So... That's fun. Uh, we have all that much more. Everybody do me a big favor. Please subscribe to the channel. We're on the road. First to the 2 million sub mark, which will take a while. But really, I want to get to that 10 million number because that's when you get the next plaque. And we like to add one, one more of these bad boys behind us. So hook a brother up with a sub. I would help. I, I would appreciate it massively. It helps tremendously in the algorithm. And without further ado, let's jump into it. So, all right, guys, look at this. Um, we got this piece of news that came out on February 1st. Intelligence officials in the U.S. have calculated that Tehran does not have full control over its proxy groups in the Middle East, including those responsible for attacking and killing U.S. troops in recent weeks. So, when I read that, my immediate thought was, oh, thank God, that U.S. intelligence agencies are now concluding, hey man, if you attack Iran directly and start a hot war with Iran directly over what their proxies are doing, that's actually not the right move, because we have no evidence that Iran proper greenlit the attacks that the various factions of Hezbollah and the Shia militias did against U.S. bases. And that made me whew, breathe a sigh of relief. Because this right here is a hint and a clue that the U.S. is not going to immediately go and try to bomb Iran. That what they will probably do is go bomb the various Shia militias who have been trying to attack U.S. bases. And remember, there were three U.S. service people who died at a base in Jordan near the border with Syria. Well, right after I see this, boom, we get confirmation of what I thought. Uh, now, the good news is we didn't attack Iran proper. Breathe a sigh of relief. But the bad news is we did a strike in response to the drone attack that killed at least three U.S. service members and injured many more. And we killed at least 39 in Iraq and Syria. So here's what they say in the New York Post. U.S. airstrikes on Iraq and Syria overnight Friday killed at least 39 people and injured several dozen others hitting more than 85 targets linked to Iran's Revolutionary Guard and related militias in the first of a series of retaliatory moves following last weekend's drone strike in Jordan that killed three U.S. Army soldiers and injured dozens more. So, um, look, my guess is, and I predicted this in the immediate aftermath of what happened on the U.S. base, I thought they're just going to unleash all sorts of holy hell on the various Shia militias that have been attacking uh, the United States outlets. And that is exactly what happened. Now, again, this is sort of this is bad in and of itself. It's an escalatory move in and of itself. But let's not get it twisted. Biden was hearing from literally everybody under the sun, Democrats, Republicans, I'm sure his close staff members. They were telling him, don't be a bitch. You got to go bomb Iran proper. And it looks like Biden had at the very least the political sense to realize, hey, maybe starting a hot war with Iran right before an election is probably a terrible idea. 
And so he didn't start a hot war with Iran. Now, by the way, we also discussed Iran forced their proxies to release a statement saying, hey, we make our own decisions. The big guys did not approve this and tell us to do it. And that was a clear sign that Iran was like, you sons of bitches, we're going to get bombed because of your actions. So now you need to take responsibility. And they did take responsibility. And so the U.S. Un unleashed holy hell on these various Shia militias. But remember, guys, at the core of all of this, at the core of all of this is Netanyahu and Israel doing a slaughter of innocent people in Gaza. That's at the core. That's the only reason the U.S. is getting attacked in the region. That's the only reason. That's the reason that the Houthis are doing what they're doing. Now, by the way, on the topic of the Houthis, we have this. Joint statement on the, on the strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen. Quote, our aim remains to de-escalate tensions and restore stability in the Red Sea. That is absurd. That's absurd. And um, just so everybody understands, the strikes are still ongoing against uh, Yemeni targets both in the Red Sea but also in Yemen proper. So anybody who thought this will be a little quick thing, it'll be in and out, it'll be over within a week or whatever, not true. Not true. And this idea that, oh, Biden's allowed to do this, it's perfectly legal. Well, certainly now that debate is over with. Because if he continues the bombing campaign, that is what we call a war. Under anybody's definition. And for that, you need a declaration of war from Congress, which he did not get. So this is illegal, this is unconstitutional, and nobody with any power is saying such a thing. So um, just to show you yet another example of what Biden has been hearing relentlessly in his ear from both sides of the political spectrum in Washington, D.C., here's Lindsey Graham uh, reminding everybody what his position is on what's happening with uh, the Shia militias attacking U.S. bases. If you want a war with us, bring it on. We'll blow you off the friggin' map. I'm not worried about losing a war with Iran. They should be worried about losing... We'll blow you off the map. Okay. So here are some updated numbers. Again, I want to reiterate, these aren't 100% factual. I think the real numbers are significantly higher than what we're being led to believe. Because no longer do the human rights groups on the ground have the infrastructure necessary to keep up with the tremendous amount of death and carnage and injuries, etc. And so, you know, you've seen the, the casualty numbers and the injury numbers sort of slow to a, a crawl coming out of Gaza, but that's not because Israel has really slowed down. It's because the capacity to track it is almost completely gone. So this is from Euromed Monitor, the human rights group. Now they say the number killed in Gaza is 35,096. Uh, 30,571 of them are civilians. You have 13,642 children that have been killed. 7,656 women who have been killed. Remember the Euromed monitor number? They try to include uh, people who are presumed dead under the rubble. That is why you see a discrepancy between what, say, the UN number is and the Euromed uh, monitor number is. And, you know, other groups have, you know, their own numbers. And uh, my guess is when all is said and done, things will get closer to what the Euromed monitor numbers are. And if anything, more than that, because again, we've lost the ability to really track it very accurately. So there's 67,240 people who are injured. 121 journalists have been killed. By the way, that number continues to slowly creep up. This is the most deadly conflict for journalists in human history. I think the last time we saw it, it was 117 journalists who've been killed. Now we're at 121. By the way, a lot of them are being targeted on purpose by Israel because they don't want people on the ground who can get the story out about Gaza. There's now 2 million displaced people. By the way, in Gaza, there's 2.3 million people total. 2 million of the 2.3 million are now homeless. They're now homeless. They have nowhere to go back to because their houses are rubble or partially destroyed. And there's no infrastructure left anymore. And there's nowhere to go get food. There's nowhere to, you know fulfill the basic needs of life. There's 79,200 homes that are completely destroyed, 207,000 partially destroyed homes. We're talking about the majority of Gaza has effectively been wiped off the map. Um, and they go on here. You guys can pause the video if you'd like and, and go through the numbers, but I'll just give you a couple more here. 478 mosques have been damaged by Israel. Three, have, three churches have been damaged. There's 309 doctors and nurses who have been killed, 689 healthcare professionals total, including paramedics and things of that nature. Uh, they've been 
uh, attacked at least, injured at the very least. So, it, I mean, it's crazy. 26 hospitals. And I'm, o- I'm always reminded of that one time there was one hospital strike where the Israeli side tried to raise a stink about it and say, it wasn't us, it was Islamic Jihad, it was a misfired Islamic Jihad missile. Interesting. Even if I grant you that, which I don't, what about the other 25 hospitals that have been attacked? Was that all, uh, you know, misfired Islamic Jihad missiles? Or is Occam's Razor the obviously correct answer here, which is that you guys are bombing every kind of civilian infrastructure imaginable on purpose? I think we all know the answer to that. All right, so now, uh, I mentioned this at the top of the show here, but an IDF psychological warfare unit ran a telegram channel targeting Israeli audience without approval. The army initially denied involvement, but an internal investigation following Haaretz expose revealed complicity. So in other words, what they're saying here, and uh, you know, you can go read the whole article over on Haaretz, but um, there was basically this like snuff film telegram channel where it's like, hey, here's a video of a Palestinian child being murdered. Here's a video of, uh, you know, one getting decapitated. Here we're dragging one through the street. Here we're mowing down people indiscriminately. They would post the most gruesome videos you can imagine, um, and it would be to riotous applause and cheer. People would look at it like, hooray, you're our heroes. We love what you're doing. Keep murdering those Palestinians. And um, again, we commented on this previously, but now we have verification that indeed it was the IDF that was running this. So basically, Nazi-level atrocities, uh, bragging about them, showing them off, getting approval and pats on the back over it, and it is officially being run by the IDF. That's great. That's great. Uh, By the way, the only upside of this is that um, hopefully it can be used as evidence in the ICJ's genocide trial against Israel. And we said it before, and I'll say it again. IDF TikTok is the ICJ's best friend. Because they are just, day by day, they are adding war crime on top of war crime within war crime. And uh, hopefully that can be used to build the very obvious case that we're currently witnessing of a genocidal campaign against the people of Gaza. All right, so now there was a lot of discussion around a potential deal between Hamas and the Israeli government. But it appears like we've hit a brick wall. In those talks, and as Ryan Grimm points out here, Hamas's key demand, according to reports, is that Israel agree to end the war. Major sticking point. So he's uh, citing here a Jerusalem Post piece. Under what terms will an agreement be made? At issue between Hamas and Israel is the terror group's insistence that a deal must include an end to the Gaza war, while Israel has stood on its principled position that it must be allowed to complete its military campaign to oust Hamas from the enclave. Yeah, I doubt you're going to get Hamas to agree. That as a term of the deal, they no longer exist or are totally ousted from power. That seems like a non-starter. I mean, imagine, flip the script, and imagine Hamas said to the Israeli government, everybody who's in the Israeli government needs to be totally gone, and that's going to be part of our deal. Would Netanyahu agree to that? Would Smotrich or Ben Gavir agree to that? Would anybody? No, nobody would agree to that. So, look, the, the speculation is they're drawing this ridiculously hard line on the Israeli side to purposefully never get a deal. And then they'll just keep pointing the finger at Hamas and say it's their fault. Well, look, I hate to say it, but it is an absolutely reasonable condition to say, in order to make a deal, you have to stop wiping Gaza off the map. That's very basic. That's like 101 level stuff. Um, And by the way, what Grimm was responding to here is in the Jerusalem Post. Breaking, Hamas is set to reject on Sunday evening the Gaza hostage and ceasefire deal proposed in Paris last week. Saudi outlet al Arabia Arabia. Arab, Arabia, let's go with that, reported. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, again, that's a reasonable demand. In fact, any sort of deal that doesn't flat out end the destruction of Gaza, why would anybody agree to it? All right, so then there's also this. Hamas wants Israel to release Marwan Barghouti, but because he is widely viewed as the man most likely to unite Palestinian factions and serve as a credible negotiator of a Palestinian state. He is the last he is the last many that obstructionist Netanyahu wants to let go. Um, so this is a guy's name who has been floated multiple times about how he unites the Palestinian factions. He's a leader that's better than the Palestinian Authority, which is viewed as corrupt collaborators with the Israeli government. Um, and Hamas, which is viewed as a hardline militant terrorist extremist group, which, you know, believes more in violence to reach their ends 
this is a guy who can sort of unite the different factions. And that's probably why the Israeli government would uh, literally never want to have him released. But that is a, a key thing that the Palestinians are asking for. All right, so then we also get this. Breaking $17 billion vote on an Israel bill. House votes next week on a $17 billion standalone bill for Israel funding. GOP statement, quote, Given the Senate's failure to move appropriate legislation in a timely fashion and the perilous circumstances currently facing Israel, the House will continue to lead. Next week, we will take up and pass a clean standalone Israel supplemental package during debate in the House and in numerous subsequent statements, Democrats made clear that their primary objection to the original House bill was with its offsets. The Senate will no longer have excuses, however misguided, against swift passage of this critical support for our ally. Okay, so originally the conversation was, look, we're going to put all these things together. We're going to do Ukraine aid, we're going to do Israel aid, and we're going to do border security. It's all going to be part of one bill, and this way everybody gets a little bit of what they want. Right. I mean, both sides want more money to Israel because they're totally psychopathic and brought up, bought off by the Israel lobby. Uh, Republicans are a little more skeptical of Ukraine funding, but Democrats want the Ukraine funding. And both sides in D.C. want a new border bill and more funds for the border to try to make it so that you stop the flow of migrants coming into the country. So that was the original thing that was being discussed. Now, the Senate worked out a border agreement. The border agreement is very conservative. It is very right wing. Um, it's the toughest border bill in decades at the very least. And um, you have Republicans like James Lankford, who's out there basically cheerleading this thing and saying, like, if we don't take this as Republicans, we're psychos because this is what we've been asking for for so long. But House Republicans are like, nah, screw that. We don't want that. And they're basically out there lying about the bill relentlessly. They say things like, this bill allows in 5,000 people before it shuts down the border. And we can't allow a 5,000 person invasion every single day. That's crazy. Now, that's not true. What they're saying about the bill is not true. So after 5,000 people, then all due process is rejected. So it's immediate expulsion after those 5,000 people. But it's not like those 5,000 people can stay. They will just be subject to the standard process and procedure of having due process, and then they will probably be rejected, right? So they're totally misstating the reality of the situation. They're acting like 5,000 people are let in scot-free, um, and then after that, the border gets shut down. No, those 5,000 people will almost certainly be rejected, but there will be due process, and they will get their day in court, and then a decision will be made. Uh, and after 5,000, nobody has due process anymore. Which, by the way, just for the record, I'm skeptical this is even something that's legal and constitutional and allowed. In a world that made sense, the court system would say, you can't just decide unilaterally due process no longer matters. Due process is supposed to be off the table. It's supposed to be something that everybody, you know, has the right to in a civilized society. So the House Republicans are saying we're going to block this, even though it's a very conservative border bill. And so then we're left with how do we move forward on anything? And the answer is very simple. The one thing they all agree on is the one thing they're pushing. So the House is like, 17 billion for Israel. Let's vote on it. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, it's very likely that it passes the House. It passes the Senate. Israel gets 17 billion more dollars in the midst of their genocide. It's also possible that for political reasons, it's held up because you know, the Democrats really want Ukraine funding with it, you know, uh, and they think the only way to get all of it through is to package all those things together. So we'll see what happens. But just the idea that we're talking about $17 billion more for Israel in the midst of what they're doing to Gaza is absolutely astonishing. And it is just a disgusting part of the historical record, which will haunt us for generations to come, because the history books will not go easy on this genocidal maniac country that is Israel and what they're doing in Gaza right now. All right, so now let me show you this. Do you approve of Biden's handling of the Hamas war? No, 70%. Yes, 15%. This is among voters under the age of 35. The older you get, the more they're like, yeah, fuck it. We believe in black and white thinking. We believe in pure good and pure evil. And uh, we're on the side of Israel. So rah, rah, Biden, rah, rah, Israel. Uh, but younger voters are not at all buying what he is selling. 15% approve of Biden's handling of what's happening in Israel and Gaza right now. So this is interesting. Um, John Fetterman sat down for an interview with uh, somebody from The Intercept. And um, Fetterman has come out and said, look, I support the suspension of funds going to the UNRWA. As you all know, the UNRWA is the 
group, the agency of the UN that's most responsible for taking care of everything involving Palestinians, like humanitarian aid and things of that nature. So the reason why uh, Fetterman says, I want to suspend the, you know, the funds going to them is because the Israeli government made accusations that 12 of the 30,000 people that work in that agency have Hamas ties, therefore cut off funding completely. And by the way, this also coincides with when the ICJ said it is plausible that Israel is committing a genocide and they now have to allow in the humanitarian aid. Well, guess what? The UNRWA is responsible for delivering the humanitarian aid. And immediately after that decision came down, boom, Israel drops this fake scandal. And all of a sudden, everybody says we're cutting off funding to the UNRWA. So now there won't even be humanitarian aid to deliver because the funding has been cut. Okay. So John Fetterman comes out, typical psychopathic, narcissistic fashion. So I support cutting that off. So the person in The Intercept who's interviewing Fetterman goes, okay, well, if you're saying based on Israeli allegations alone that you want to cut off funding the UNRWA, why would you not have the same standard for the Israeli government who's accused of all kinds of war crimes and, you know, egregious actions that kill massive numbers of civilians? Why would you not support the U.S. cutting off funding to them? Because again, you're saying on the one hand, allegations are fine. In this instance, why wouldn't allegations be fine in the other instance to cut off funding? Look at how this goes. Fetterman also said that he supports the suspension of funding to the UNRWA. When asked why the standard of suspending funding while investigating serious allegations doesn't apply to the Israeli government, Fetterman dodged the question. Fetterman said, well, again, it, well, it's not. We need a full investigation and, and find out just how much a part of it was about that and how much, you know, the old question, how much they knew and when they knew that. The Intercept says, so you're saying that for Israel as well? Fetterman says, yeah, okay, so good, all right, well, good. This guy's brain is so fucking fried, he doesn't even understand the point that's being made to him. The point is like, if allegations are enough to cut off funding to the UNRWA, allegations should be enough for the U.S. to cut off funding to Israel proper. Cut off the money, cut off the weapons. He's like, <laughs> but I'm a hack who's bought off by the Israel lobby, so I, I, I don't know. Squirrel. He's just stumbling over there. Yeah, okay, so good. All right, well, good. This guy's embarrassing, man. This guy's this guy's a joke. More on him in a little bit. All right, so um, now let me get to the token gesture from the U.S. government here. And there's an interesting fact that goes along with this. So Biden comes out and says the U.S. is going to sanction some illegal Israeli settlers. And by the way, that is a grand total of four people. There's literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of is illegal Israeli settlers. He's sanctioning four of them. Okay. So he announces this. By the way, immediately after he announces it, what does he do? He goes to Michigan to campaign. Michigan, which has a, you know, Dearborn has a largest Arab, Arab American and Muslim American community in the country. And uh, he goes there and, it, you know, she's thinking like, yes, I'll get a hero's welcome now that I'm standing up to the illegal settlers. You're still arming Netanyahu. You're still backing this genocide. And you do some, like, token sanctions. By the way, how are these sanctions going to have any effect whatsoever? It's not like these four illegal Israeli settlers were, like, desperate to get into the United States. So these sanctions are effectively just, they're for show, right? It's not like, I'm happy that he did it over nothing, but it, it just, it's window dressing is what it is. And I think that's pretty obvious. Well, even to this window dressing, the Israeli government and the usual ghouls and goblins absolutely flip out. They flip out. And they immediately call Biden's move, say with me, anti-Semitic. It is anti-Semitic to go after extremist, illegal Israeli settlers who are currently stealing land at this very second. I mean, it's beyond parody, right? So Biden comes out and does this, then goes to campaign in Michigan. That didn't do much to heal the wounds with the Arab American and Muslim American community. I hate to tell you, Joe. Um, Adam Johnson makes a great point here. Pro-Israel groups pissing and moaning about these token sanctions against four Israeli settlers doesn't mean they're meaningful. Pro-Israel groups are like cop unions. Their default position is a maximalist self-pity and crying. It's how they work the refs. It's perma-bad faith. That is exactly right. That's exactly right. Money controls U.S. politics. It's that simple. And so that's why Saudi Arabia always gets whatever the hell they want, because they send a tremendous amount of money into U.S. politics. That's why Israel always gets what they want. And, um... This is a great example of it here. Even tweaking ever so slightly, even a symbolic hit against the far-right Israeli ethno-nationalist movement. And it's, oh, how could you? You hate all Jews. This isn't fair. What are you doing? 
honestly, it's it's pathetic, and nobody should fall for the uh, for the self victimization narrative that as Adam Johnson lays out here for you. All right, so we also have this. Owen Jones says. We were told that there were 12 UNRWA employees out of 30,000 involved in October 7th. Now it's down to six. And Sky News reports the Israeli intelligence documents make several claims without any proof. And many claims don't directly implicate the UNRWA anyway. So in other words, the allegations from Israel were just allegations. They appear to be mucked up and exaggerated, etc. And... As a result of just the allegations, boom, funding was cut from another, a number of major countries cut funding to the UNRWA, which is just keeping Palestinians from getting even the possibility of humanitarian aid in the midst of what is basically a famine on the ground. People are starving to death. People don't have clean water, etc. So, um, as Ryan Grimm points out here, Western media took apparently exaggerated Israeli intelligence, dropped with precision to coincide with the ICJ ruling, and completely changed the conversation, leading to the cutoff of humanitarian aid amid a famine. Now we learn more details, and it's less than what we were told. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Totally changed the conversation of Western media from these guys, it's plausible these guys are committing genocide, to, oh my god, the UN agency trying to end the starvation and deliver humanitarian aid. They're actually Hamas. Please. All right, then we have this. I mentioned uh, that I bring Fetterman back up. Here we go. Can't make this up. Biden has been consulting with John Fetterman on how to reach young voters disillusioned with Biden's policy toward Gaza. The White House, in a reflection of their public confidence, hubris, regarding the politics of Biden's, uh, Biden's positioning on Israel, arranged a call with Senator John Fetterman. How do I get the youth to love me? I don't know. Let's go to the guy who just lost, like, all of his youth support in the span of a month or two. I mean, the amount of disconnection from the base is something I don't know if I've ever seen before. I mean, this is as dense as it gets. All right, so now let's end on this. Talk a little bit about the media. So I, we just got hit with one banger after another banger after another banger. I mean, I woke up the other day and it was just like, I can't believe this is a real article. I can't believe this is real. Oh my God, we somehow topped it. Okay, so... Let's start with this one, Wall Street Journal, opinion section. Welcome to Dearborn, America's jihad capital. Imams and politicians in the Michigan City side with Hamas against Israel and Iran against the U.S. This is like when all of those articles came out after they passed support for a ceasefire in Chicago. They accused the government of Chicago of just being pro-Hamas. No, you lying jackal hyena idiots. They are pro-ceasefire, not pro-Hamas. That's your little shitty Zionist spin that you put on it. Spare me. You're absolute nonsense. This is the same thing. Why are they calling Dearborn um, America's jihad capital? Because there's a lot of Muslims that live there. So obviously, they must be extremists who are pro-Hamas and pro-Iran and pro-jihad. So they just woke up and they said, let's just be totally bigoted and xenophobic. Let's do that. Let's smear an entire American city. Then we also have this from Brett Stevens. Attacking Iran's proxies won't do the job. In other words, what are you doing? Go bomb Iran proper. Start a war with Iran proper. Yes. So they woke up. It's bigotry. It's xenophobia. It's outright bloodthirsty warmongering. I woke up and saw these two articles right away. And then, ready? I saved the best for last. So then we go to um, New York Times, Tom, Thomas Friedman, this goofball. Understanding the Middle East through the animal kingdom. He goes on to say, well, the U.S. is like an old lion. Israel's like a lemur. By the way, I love the, you know, think about it. The U.S. is a lion. Israel's a, a lemur. And what's uh, Iran? Iran is like some parasite wasp that lays its eggs and then the eggs hatch and do all these nefarious things. It's like, homie wrote this in 2024. What am I supposed to do with the media, man? What am I supposed to do with the media? And you gotta understand, everything I'm showing you here, these are like, viewed as, these are the serious people in American media. Not like those ridiculous YouTubers 
who are passionate and who curse and who think things through. This is like what the serious conversation is in the country. Well, obviously we should bomb Iran. Obviously Dearborn, Michigan is, is full of jihadists. Obviously we should talk about Middle Eastern countries like they're full of animals and parasites. I don't know, man. I don't know. Again, what we're in right now is a post 9-11 hysteria type situation where everybody shut their brain off. Everybody's going based off of emotions and feels. They believe in this pure good guy, pure bad guy narrative, you know, and uh, bottom line is young people are not buying it at all. Not even a little bit. And uh, what Biden is doing here can come back to bite him in the ass colossally. But um, yeah, here we are. Every day it seems to get worse and worse. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.